we went on a holiday to Scotland a few years ago. Um, the Scottish people, when we went there, were quite annoyed with us. They were saying, this is the only week of sun we've had all year. We're glad you're enjoying our sun. It's almost like they felt we were robbing it. And our children got to play with some Scottish children up there. And then on the final day, Evie, who was very young at the time, wanted to play with these children. And the mum said, oh, I'm sorry, she's got a sickness bug, so she can't play with you. And we're like, oh, I hope she feels better. And then Evie was sick um, all over me. And we had to go home on the train the next day. So I thought, I hope I feel okay. And I went to bed, and the next morning I did not feel good at all. I laid on the couch, clutching my stomach. I'm very good at being ill, very talented at expressing the inner ruh of myself. And Joe busily packed everything up. We took the car that we'd borrowed for the week, and we dropped that off, and we got on the train. And as we sat on the train, you know what it's like when you feel, you just think, please, nobody talk to me. And I sat next to this dear old lady who would not stop asking me questions. And I thought, if I tell her I'm a vicar, that will shut her up, because usually that can shut down a conversation. But she loved that. She wanted to know all about the job and what I did. And she had a great auntie who was in the Boer War, who'd been a vicar, and blah, 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 blah. And I'm just sitting there thinking, please just stop talking to me. Into the journey a bit, I began to feel a bit better. So I thought, Joe always tells me to eat my greens and my veg, so I'll have some tomatoes and cucumber and a Twix. Always have a Twix just as a little thing to keep you going. And when they'd gone down, I felt that they hadn't reached their final destination. And I said to Joe, I feel really sick now. She said, well, what have you eaten? I said, tomatoes and cucumber. She went, why? You don't eat that when you feel ill. That is going to make you even worse. I said, yeah, OK, we can talk about it later. And I walked to the disabled toilet because there wasn't another one near us. And I opened it, you know, they go, like that. And as I walked in, I just vomited all down the wall. And a little bit of it got into the toilet. And then I was in there like that. I thought, I'm fine now. I feel really good, actually. So I went back out and I walked down the line to where we were sat, and I saw the guard coming up, and I said to him, um, you might want to check that toilet. I think somebody's been sick in it. <laughs> he said, OK, thank you. And I looked at Joe, and Joe was giving me that Medusa death stare, like, you... I said, and I went, what? She went, everyone in the carriage heard that. The door wasn't even shut as you started. It was a complete mess. Today, we're looking at a passage of scripture that is really messy. And if I put my foot in it with you, which I might do, please come and talk to me. It's a messy passage about the mess of life as Jesus up the mountain on the Sermon of the Mount gets into some uncomfortable discussion topics that affect most of us or affect people that we know as we go through the course of life. It's messy. It's smelly, it's uncomfortable, it's awkward. But I believe we need to look at all of Scripture as we go through and not skip over just to our favourite or best bits. Matthew 5, 21 to 32. Let's watch as Jesus teaches the disciples. You heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny.
You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. In that passage, three times Jesus says along the lines of, you have heard it was said, blah, 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 but I tell you. Jesus is not opposing the Torah, the first five books, the Jewish teaching of the Bible here. He's extending it, as Jewish rabbis would always do. So he's not saying, oh, that that was taught to you is rubbish, and I'm going to teach you the real stuff. He's saying, that was good, but actually, if you just extend it a little bit more, you can live a more fruitful life. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but names will never hurt me. What a load of rubbish that little rhyme is, isn't it? Who has been at school and been cut down by a name that they were called? Even when you hear it a few decades later, it strikes right the way through us. Sticks and stones can break my bones, and names can jolly well crush me. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court, and anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penalty. You shall not murder is one of the Ten Commandments. And the Hebrew word for murder means intentional killing. God told Noah that murder should be punished by death, but five chapters before that in Genesis chapter 4, he protected Cain when he killed his brother Abel. And Moses, who committed murder before he ran off to be a shepherd in the book of Exodus, he was a murderer as well, but he set the Jewish people free. Murder is not something that God supports. But Jesus extends this teaching as he builds a fence around murder by forbidding anger. Don't be angry with your brother or sister, he says. Brother or sister is somebody who is a community member with you, the village that you live in, the school gate that you hang around, the church that we are a part of. Don't be angry with them because you'll end up getting dragged before the local court, the Sanhedrin as it was then, the religious leaders. How often have churches bickered over things and been angry with one another and we wonder why people won't come in? Why do I want to go there? I get enough grief at work, at home, down the coffee shop. We should be a place where there isn't that kind of anger, Jesus says. We are entrusted to one another to care for one another. It is my duty to love you. And it is your duty to love me. 
and to love each other. And it's tough at times, isn't it? Because some of you are not perfect like I am. And you can get right up my nose. And I can get right up your nose. Because we're human beings. Jesus says, don't get angry. Be reconciled with one another. If you can be. And if I've said sorry to someone when I've offended them, and I keep saying sorry, and they will have nothing to do with me, if that's your experience, then we have to leave them with God, knowing that we've done our part, that we've gone as far as we can go. So can we never be angry? Is Jesus saying that we can never be angry? The anger that he forbids here is anger without cause. We should be angry at injustice. We should see starving children on television and be moved to tears and in anger want to solve it. Amy Jill Levine, a Jewish writer and theologian, said, if we are not made angry by suffering, by cheating, by indifference, then we are not human. One Christian writer called it a, a holy indignation, that we look at things that aren't right and we think, I'm going to get so angry that I'm going to change it. That's what Martin Luther King did in the civil rights movement. He moved to a nice black middle class church to finish his master's degree quietly to be able to preach twice on a Sunday and work through it with the odd pastoral visit. And then a woman was told, get off the bus because of the colour of your skin. And he, as a five foot six man at the age of 25, with no experience, got angry about it and changed America. Anger, in the right way, is a good thing. Wendell Berry is an American farmer, poet, novelist, and Christian. And he was driving a friend of his back to the airport. And his friend said to him, you know, Wendell, I get so tired. When I sit at the airport with my cup of coffee, all I do is eye up the women as they walk past. I pretend I'm reading my magazine, but all I'm doing is checking out the shape of them. And I'm sick to death of being that kind of bloke. Wendell Berry said, tell me about it. He said, every time I stand up at an agricultural conference to begin to speak, I check out the women. He said, the last conference I was at, I checked out the women and I saw a woman. I thought, oh, she's nice. Then I realised it was my wife. He said, I felt so chuffed. Jesus talks about adultery. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if you, your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Now, if you've been distracted by the word hell in this passage, let's remember clearly that there is very little, if any, teaching on hell in the Old Testament, which is the context from which Jesus is teaching. Hell in Jewish thinking is, when we die, we just kind of drift away. It's how C.S. Lewis looked at hell in his book, The Great Divorce. It's not this idea that there's a God who holds you in continual punishment in an eternal place. It's just, you'll just drift away, you'll become nothing, you'll become less than human if you keep living life in this way. In Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, it says that both, both adulterers should be put to death. But there is no evidence in Jewish history that this law was ever carried out. Think of David and Bathsheba. They committed adultery and both of them lived on. In fact, in the Jewish teachings around the Bible, they go out of their way to protect people from death when they've been caught in the act of adultery. Rabbis generally sought to prevent death rather than encourage it. In one of their writings, Makot verse 1, it says, A Sanhedrin that executes once in seven years is called murderous. The Jews would do everything they could to preserve life. Hosea, the prophet, 
married a woman who was caught in adultery, ran away to be a prostitute, and he went back and he got her to be his wife. And he did it time after time after time as a way of saying to the Jewish people, you keep running after foreign gods, and God's going to keep coming back and getting you every time you commit adultery against God. Because God's not the kind that says, done, I'm going to have you executed. I want you to be mine, says God. This teaching was at a time where men could marry more than one woman in Israel. Different times to the context that we live in now. And adultery was all on, and I don't like this and I hope you don't either, in their culture it was all on the woman. So it's the woman that would commit adultery if she was married or engaged to be married. The man, it wasn't his fault. Which gives a bit of context, doesn't it, to when Jesus has the woman thrown in front of him who's been caught in the act of adultery. I don't know about you, I've often thought, well, where is the man? But in their culture, that didn't matter. Because he's fine, thank you very much. Amy Jewell Levine says, at the time of Jesus, a Jewish man could have sexual relations with a divorcee, a prostitute, or an otherwise unmarried or unengaged woman. It might not look nice, it doesn't, but it was not forbidden. Times were different. Women were oppressed, I think, even more than they are now. They were a commodity at worst. In this context, Jesus extends this teaching as he builds a fence around adultery by forbidding lust. Lust can mean desire and is linked to coveting your neighbour's house or your neighbour's spouse in Exodus and Deuteronomy. Lust is thus a form of greed, a desire to possess what belongs to someone else. And lust is not reserved for heterosexual males, as Jesus teaches it here. I remember when I was younger, saying to someone when I was training to be a minister, oh, I'll never, I'll never commit adultery. I'll never do it. And they said, that's always your first step towards it. When you're too confident, too arrogant in your own strength. But if you remain on guard, you start in a better place. I think the hyperbole of gouging out your eyes so that you don't lust would dampen any sexual desire, wouldn't it? In the Bible reading, did you see when Jesus sees the guy looking at the other woman and then the wife gave him what for? That's not in scripture, but it's a good way of showing it, isn't it? Have you ever been caught looking at someone else when you're with your wife or your husband or your partner? Why not imagine that they're always with you, that they're always with me? when you're walking down the street, when you're at work, when you're interacting with other people. Jesus says, don't lust. Dallas Willard said, also eliminated if we didn't lust would be the unfair treatment of those who do not attract the lusting look. They do not have the sexual edge that facilitates others, often quite subtly on the path of life. Favorable, favorable attention, a more forgiving application of standards of performance, advancement in position and financial reward. And of course, they cannot usually say anything at all about this because it would be a humiliating admission of their unattractiveness. In silence, they suffer. Have you ever been overlooked for someone else and you know why? but you can't say. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, every even momentary desire is a barrier to the following of Jesus. The gains of lust are trivial compared with the loss it brings. This doesn't mean we can't admire beauty. It doesn't mean we can't say, oh, that person I think is attractive. There's nothing wrong with that. But when that thought becomes far more, it's dangerous. My mum loves James Martin, the chef. At her 65th or 70th birthday, we had a cardboard cutout of him at the party so that he was there with us. I don't know what she finds attractive about him, but she does. She's strange. 
in so many ways. That's a sermon series in and of itself. But it's not wrong to say that. It's wrong when that recognition becomes a thought that becomes a story, that becomes a passion, that becomes a lust, that we play over and over and over again in our heads. If you struggle with it, find someone you trust and talk to them about it. I've in the past in my churches said to elders in the church, I find that person and that person attractive. If you see me around them too much, come down on me like a ton of bricks. Because there are too many ministers and leaders in churches who have messed up royally in this area and it damages the church. Can we desire our spouse? Can we look at them and think, oh, when Joe comes out to me sometimes and says, Do you want, shall I wear the red top or the blue top? And I say, oh, I like the red top. Well, what's wrong with the blue top? I didn't say there's anything wrong with the blue top. I just said, wear the red top tonight because I think it looks nice. But wear the blue top if you want. I don't care. Why did you even ask me? Whatever I'd said, if I said blue, it'd be why not? Just choose one. Go. It's okay to look at your spouse and think, oh. Because God wired us that way. To find them attractive, physically, intellectually, emotionally, spiritually. To be in love with them. Because we're not lusting for them in the way that Jesus talks about it, which is, I desire that person and I want to own them, although they're not mine. Because you already own that person in a healthy biblical way, because you've shared covenant promises and said, I will be yours and you will be mine. And if we're single, it's okay to look and admire beauty. One of my great frustrations as a minister is that people generally only come to see me when they're thinking about divorce, when one of them has decided that they've had enough of the marriage. When they came for marriage classes, they sat as close as you physically could on the couch to learn about marriage. And then they come in months, years, decades later, and they sit as far away as they can, cold and distanced to one another. And however much I plead, encourage, one of them has already decided, I'm out. Jesus says, it has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. For Matthew, this word pornea, which he uses here, um, is the word that we get pornography from. And it's sexual betrayal, it's incestuous relationships, it's an illegal relationship or a rude act. And that word pornea comes from the Hebrew word ervat davar, which is frustratingly vague. It can mean something objectionable or something displeasing. And so the teaching that Jesus has here from Deuteronomy 24 verse 1 says, if a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house, that's okay. So the teaching has moved from if there is sexual immorality in the marriage, you can get a divorce, to on the bloke's side, again, if there's anything displeasing about your wife... You can give her a marriage, a divorce certificate, and she's gone. There is historical writings of men divorcing their wives because the tea was burnt. So I, right, I've given her a certificate. She's got her 50 metres back crawl swimming certificate. She's got her GCSE certificate. And I've given her a divorce certificate, which is so much heavier than these other ones. But it was given as if it was equal to them. I've given you that. That gives you some security. It gives you some financial backing. We're better than all the other nations around us that do it in a way that gives the woman no chance. So off you go. And the woman had three choices. To live with an understanding relative who would take her in as a servant. 
because we can't economically afford to have you as an equal, to find another man, hopefully, or to become a prostitute. Jesus says this isn't on. I've spoken about divorce at length in other sermons. If you want the notes, please ask me and I'll be more than happy to give them to you. But Jesus here extends his teaching as he builds a fence around victims of divorce by forbidding easy divorces. Men, don't divorce her because she's burnt the food. It's not right. You made a lifelong commitment before God. Stick to it. So can I ever get a divorce? And there will be many different views in this place on this subject. I find Amy Jill Levine helpful here. Far too many people have been trapped in loveless or abusive marriages because of a narrow reading of gospel passages. The message of the text is one of peace, not war. It speaks of the Christian home as the model of the love between Christ and the church. Christian marriages that do not offer this model are perhaps not those that need remain forever. If you are trapped in an abusive marriage or relationship, please talk to somebody you trust about it before it's too late. If you're in a marriage that is becoming bland, liven it up if you can. I know of couples who've sat down and said, are we going to keep living like this for the next 20, 30, 40 years? Is this what we signed up for? Or are we going to make some changes? Because I know in the busyness of life, and if you have babies, if you're blessed to have those, and they become teenagers, and then they become adults, and you never get them off your hands, do you? When they're still 40, 50, you're still worrying about them like they were when they were five, sat on the couch with you, watching Bagpuss. And that intimate relationship between the spouses can separate in the busyness of life. Divorce, I believe, is a last resort if a marriage cannot be saved. A last resort. We've looked at some messy stuff today. Murder, adultery, divorce. And as I wrote those down in my notes, I thought, M-A-D, it's mad. All of these things lead to madness, to messiness. And Jesus doesn't want them. My last memory of my dad in a positive way before he died about three years ago was our fence blew down in our garden. And my, one of my kids, as we got off of school, said, oh, the fence is blown down. I said, no, it's not. Don't be starved. They said, well, why has the dog just run out onto Woodland Walk then? Oh, yeah, the fence is blown down. So I phoned my dad and I said, dad, can you please come around and help me put the fence back up? And so we had to go down a six-foot ditch the other side of our garden and lift up the fence and prop it up and put it in place and tie some rope around a fir tree that we'd got to keep it there in a kind of straight yet wonky fashion. And when we finished, I looked at my dad and he was blowing hard. And I thought, he's not as strong as he was. This illness that he's hiding from us is affecting his life. The last thing he did with me was put up a fence of protection around my home. And every time I look at that fence, I think of him and I thank him. Because on my own, I couldn't have done it. Jesus is challenging us in uncomfortable ways here to build fences around our lives, our marriages, our relationships and our church. So that we have protection in life for murder and anger, protection for purity against adultery and lust, and protection for marriages and committed relationships against easy divorces. I hope you've not enjoyed this sermon as much as I've not enjoyed sharing it, and I mean that in a positive way. But friends, we do need to talk about these messy situations. 
so that we can stay close to Jesus. Let's pray. Let's pray together. Are any of those three a challenge for you in your life? If they are in a moment of quiet now, why don't you bring it before God? Jesus, we pray in your gracious name. Amen.